In this video, we'll be going through the IGCSE Computer Science Paper 1, Version 1 from the 2023 May June exam series. Let's get started. Question 1 Binary is a number system used by computers. Question A says tick one box to show which statement about the binary number system is correct. Either it is a base 1 system, a base 2 system, a base 10 system, or a base 16 system. Binary means 2. Since there are two numbers in the binary system, 0 and 1. Another number system we know is denary, which means 10. This is because there are 10 digits in the denary system. The other system we know of is hexadecimal, which has 16 unique characters. All 10 from denary, plus 6 letters. Going back to the original question, the base of the system determines how many digits there are within the system. In the case of binary, since we have two digits, it must be a base 2 system. Question B says denary numbers are converted to binary numbers to be processed by a computer. Convert these three denary numbers to 8-bit binary numbers. We'll go through two separate methods to show how they are different and how one might be easier to use than the other. But it is entirely up to you which method you use in the exam. Let's start with the denary number 50. Let's use method 1 to convert this into a binary number. The process of this method is to take the denary number and divide it by 2. In this case, we get an answer of 25. We also want to keep track of the remainder of the division. In this case, it is a perfect division, meaning that the remainder is going to be 0. We'll now repeatedly divide this number by 2 until we get down to 0. Let's take 25 and divide it by 2 again. In this case, the result is 12, with a remainder of 1. Again, we'll take this number and divide it by 2. 12 divided by 2 is going to give us 6, with a remainder of 0. Let's keep going and divide 6 by 2, in which case we get 3, with a remainder of 0. 3 divided by 2 is going to give us 1, with a remainder of 1. And again, 1 divided by 2 will give us a result of 0, remainder 1. We've now reached an answer of 0. If we keep dividing this by 2, we're continually going to get 0, remainder 0. So there's no reason to continue, and we can stop there. Now to get the binary number from this, we read the remainders from the bottom to the top. So the result is going to be 1, 1, 0, 0. 1, 0. One bit of information that's easy to miss is that the question asked us to convert the denary numbers into 8 bits binary numbers. This means that our answers need to have 8 unique bits. Our answer at the moment only has 6 bits. To turn it into an 8 bit number, we simply add two zeros to the beginning. And there is the first part of the question solved. Let's now convert 102 into denary. This time, we'll use the second method. To perform the second method, we're going to start by writing 1 on the far right-hand side of the page. Then we'll multiply this number by 2 and write the result to the left of it. We'll continue doing this until we have 8 numbers. So 2 multiplied by 2 is 4, 4 multiplied by 2 is 8, 8 by 2 is 16, 16 by 2 is 32, 32 by 2 is 64, and finally, 64 by 2 is 128. To determine the binary number, we are going to write either a 0 or a 1 beneath each of these numbers. Each time we move to the next number, we'll ask if that number can fit into our denary number. If it can, we'll subtract our denary number from the current number. So we'll start at 128, and we notice that it doesn't fit into 102. So we'll write a 0. Next, we'll look at 64 and 64 can fit into 102, so we'll write a 1. Then we'll take 64, and we'll subtract it from 102. This gives us a result of 38. Now we'll compare each new number in the sequence to this new denary number. Moving on to 32, we can see that it will fit into 38, so let's write a 1. Then we'll subtract 32 from 38. This gives us a result of 6. Moving on to 16, we notice that it doesn't fit into 6, 
so we'll write a 0. 8 also does not fit into 6, so we'll write a 0 again. 4 does fit into 6, so we'll write a 1, then again subtract 4 from 6. This gives us a result of 2, and 2 does fit into 2, so we can write a 1. Subtracting 2 from 2 will give us simply 0. Finally, 1 does not fit into 0, so we can write a 0. And there we have our binary number. Let's use the second method again to convert 221 into a binary number. Let's begin by writing our sequence out again, our string of eight numbers. Now we can repeat the same process, starting on the left side with 128. This does fit into 221, so we'll write a one underneath it. Then just as before, we'll subtract 128 from 221. This gives us 93. Moving on, 64 fits into 93, so again we'll write a 1, and subtract 64 from 93. This gives us 29. 32 does not fit into 29, so write a 0. 16 does fit into 29, so write a 1, then subtract 16 from 29. This gives us 13. 8 fits into 13, so we'll write a 1 underneath it. Subtracting 8 from 13 gives us 5. 4 fits into 5, so again write a 1, and subtract it from 5. This gives us a result of 1. 2 does not fit into 1, so write a 0. And 1 fits into 1, so we can write a 1. And there is the final binary number. In the exam, you can use any of these two methods, or any other method you might have learned, as long as you get the right answer, and in this case, you give it in 8 bits. Question C says, binary numbers are stored in registers. Negative binary numbers can be represented as binary using two's complements. Complete the binary register for the denary number negative 78. You must show all your working. To complete this question, we'll follow two steps. First, we'll convert the positive denary number to binary, in this case, positive 78. Then, we'll convert the positive binary number to negative. There are lots of other ways you can complete this question, but I found this to be the easiest to understand. Let's start by converting positive 78 into a binary number, and we'll use the divide by 2 method. Starting off, we'll divide 78 by 2, which gives us a result of 39, and a remainder of 0. Don't forget to write down the remainder, as this number is vital in determining the binary number. Next, we'll take the result, 39, and divide that by 2 again. This gives us a result of 19, with a remainder of 1. Again, dividing 19 by 2 gives us a result of 9, remainder 1. 9 divided by 2 will give us a result of 4, remainder 1. 4 divided by 2 gives us a result of 2, remainder 0. 2 divided by 2 gives us 1, remainder 0. And finally, 1 divided by 2 gives us 0, remainder 1. To get the binary number, we'll read the remainders from bottom to top. This gives us 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. The output register has 8 bits, so we should turn our number into 8 bits. We can do this by adding the 0 at the beginning. And that is step 1 complete. Step 2 is to convert this positive binary number to negative. The way we can tell it is a positive binary number in 2's complement is that it begins with a 0. To convert between positive and negative in binary 2's complements, we flip the bits and add 1. Let's start by flipping the bits of our number. Flipping the bits means for every 0, we'll write a 1, and for every 1, we'll write a 0. So 0 and 0 become 1, 1. 1, 1, 1 becomes 0, 0, 0, and the last 0 becomes a 1. Then we want to add 1 to this number. To add two binary numbers, we'll write them one underneath another. Then we'll add the digits. So 1 plus 1 is going to give us 1, 0. So we'll write the 0 under digits and carry the 1 over. Moving on to the next digits, 1 plus 0 will give us 1 with no carry. 0 plus nothing is just 0, and we can write the rest of the binary number out. And there we have the final binary number. Let's write it into the register. 
And there we have this question completed. Question D. Two 8-bit binary numbers are given. Add the two 8-bit binary numbers using binary addition. Give your answer in binary, show all your working. To add two binary numbers, we'll follow these four basic rules. First, that 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. Next, that 1 plus 0 equals 1. The third rule is 1 plus 1 equals 1, 0. And finally, 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1, 1. When adding two 8-bit binary numbers, we'll start on the right and add each digit. Let's start with the first addition, 1 plus 1. To answer this, we can use the rules. This one uses rule 3 so the answer will be 1, 0. In this case, we'll write the 0 in the unit position and carry the 1 over. Let's move on to the next unit, which will be adding 1 plus 1 plus 0. Here, we can discard the 0, and again, we can follow rule 3, where 1 plus 1 gives us 1, 0. Again, we'll put 0 in the unit position, then carry the 1 over. Now we can add 1 plus 0 plus 0. This follows the second rule, which gives us 1, with no carry. Adding 0 and 0 will give us 0 based on our first rule. The next sum will be 1 plus 0, which will follow our second rule, giving us 1. We'll repeat the first addition by adding 1 plus 1, using the third rule, giving us 1, 0, place the 0, and carry over the 1. Next, we'll add 1 plus 0 plus 1. We can again discard the 0, simply adding 1 plus 1, with the third rule gives us 1, 0. And the last addition, 1 plus 0 plus 0, simply gives us 1. And there we have our final answer. Question E says, two binary numbers are added by a computer and an overflow error occurs. Explain why the overflow error occurred. When adding two numbers, we store the result in something called a register. A register has a predetermined number of bits. And if our computation gives us a result that has too many bits, the register will overflow. For example, adding these two 8-bit binary numbers will result in a carry in the last position over to the ninth bit. This bit can't be stored in the register and will usually be discarded, meaning the result in the register is incorrect. So there is an error. Let's explain this for two marks. Firstly, we can say that the result generated is greater than the register size. Next, we can say that the number of bits in the register are predetermined and the result contains too many bits. This will give us two marks completing the question. Question two, a student has a sound file that is too large to be stored on their external secondary storage device. The student compresses the sound file to make the file size smaller. The compression method used reduces the sample rate and the sample resolution of the sound file. Question A. State what is meant by the sample rate and sample resolution. To understand what sample rate and sample resolution is, we first need to understand what a sample is. To capture an analog sound wave and convert it into digital audio, we need to take samples at regular intervals. Here is an example of sampling, where each dot along the sound wave represents a sample. See that each sample across the time axis is spaced evenly, or at least as evenly as I could draw it, apart from each other. So we can define a sample as a hertz value at a point in time. The amount of time between each sample is known as the sample rate, otherwise defined as the number of samples taken per time unit. You might notice that in this diagram, the sample rate isn't very good. It's best shown in this portion of the sound wave. The values between this sample and this sample aren't tracked, and all of the information is lost in between. This means that the digital representation of the audio is not going to be as accurate as the analog version. What this means is if we increase the sample rate, in other words, we make the space between less, the recording will be more accurate. The other consideration when recording analog sound is how accurate each individual sample is. When data is represented, a range must be defined as to what the smallest and the highest value can be. We know that in binary, an 8-bit representation means a possible 256 values. This means we can store a total of 256 unique binary values. The same applies to sound waves. 
the higher this number becomes, the more accurate each sample is going to be. But it also means the larger the file size. So we can define sample resolution as the number of bits per sample. Question B says identify which type of compression has been used to compress the sound file. There are only two types of compression that we've learned at IG level. And those are lossy or lossless. Lossy compression, as the name suggests, loses data, whereas lossless does not lose any data and the original file can be retrieved. In the question, they tell us that the compression method used reduces the sample rate and the sample resolution of the sound file. If we reduce the sample resolution, we are reducing the number of bits per sample. For example, this would mean going from 8 bits down to something like 4 bits. We would be going from 256 values down to only 16 values. This means that whatever data we've stored using those 256 values would be cut out and we'd only be left with what we can store in 16 values. Reducing the sample rate has a similar effect. If we were to lower the sample rate, the time between these samples would increase and we'd lose whatever data we were storing between the samples. This means that we are definitely using a lossy compression. So let's write that in the answer. And that is this question completed. Question C. The student sends the sound file to a friend. The file is transmitted across a network that uses packet switching. Question I says identify two pieces of data that would be included in the header of each packet. When sending a large file across a network, we usually break it up into packets. Each of these packets contains a chunk of the data and will be reassembled into the original file by the person receiving the transmission. For a packet to successfully reach its destination, it must contain some important information. This information is stored in the header. The most obvious bit of information is the destination of where the packet is headed. In this case, the destination is usually its IP address. So we can write for the first answer the receiver's IP address. When packets are sent across a network, they're not necessarily received in the same order in which they are sent. To solve this, each packet is given a packet number, which tells the receiver the sequence order of the packets. This data is also stored in the header. Another piece of important information stored in the packet is the originator's address. In other words, where the file came from. This is very important for security purposes, as the receiver needs to know who actually sent the packets. But since this question is only for two marks, we can leave it at that. The next question says, explain how the file is transmitted using packet switching. When sending packets through a network, they may go through many routers to get to its destination. The operation of a router is to examine the header of a packet and to determine the shortest possible route for the packet to get to its destination. Certain routes may be better than others based on congestion and current network traffic. So after the router has determined the fastest path for the packet, it will send it to the next router in that path. You may see now how certain packets are sent in different directions, since one line may be congested with other packets. Once the router receives the packet, it does the same operation as the first router, examining the header of the packet and determining the shortest route to get to that destination. Each router will perform the same operation over and over again. Once all the packets have arrived at the destination, they can now be reconstructed to form the original file. In this case, they have arrived out of order, but since we have the packet number in each header, the receiver can reorder them. Let's now explain that process for five marks to answer the question. First, we'll say that the file is divided into packets. Then we can say each packet is sent by the router. The router will determine the fastest available route for the packet to reach its destination. Each router the packet arrives at performs this operation until it reaches the receiver. Once all the packets are received, they are then reordered to form the original file, as they may have arrived out of order. If a packet goes missing during the operation, this is known as packet loss and the receiver will request the packet from the sender again. But that is this question complete. Question 3. Secondary storage devices are used to store data in a computer. Question A says circle three components that are secondary storage devices. Let's solve this by crossing out non-secondary storage devices. 
Firstly, CPU is not a storage device, so we can cross that out. A sensor is also not a storage device, so we'll cross that one out. A register is a temporary memory container that is held on the CPU, meaning it is not a secondary storage device, so let's cross that out. Random access memory is used for storing data. However, that data gets deleted when the computer loses power, meaning it is not secondary storage, so we'll cross that out. Read-only memory, or ROM, is classified as primary memory, since it can be accessed by the CPU. So therefore, it is not secondary storage. This leaves us with three options, the compact disk, the hard disk drive, and the solid state drive. Question four. Complete the statements about different types of software. Use the terms from the list. Some of the terms in the list will not be used. You should only use a term once. Let's go through each of these sentences. The first one says, blank software provides the services that the computer requires. An example is utility software. So we need some type of software that is going to provide services that the computer requires. There are two different types of software that we know of, application software and system software. Software that is required for the computer to run will be system software. So we can cross that out. The next sentence says, Blank software is run on the operating system. The only other type of software that we know is application software. And this matches the description since application software runs on our operating system. The next sentence says the blank system is run on the firmware. So we can look for words that precede system. In this case, the only word that makes sense which precedes system is going to be operating. And this makes sense since the operating system runs on firmware. The next part of the sentence, firmware which is run on the blank. We know that firmware is permanent software which is hard-coded into our read-only memory. So we can say that firmware will be run on the hardware. And that is this question complete. Question five. A farm has an automated drinking system for its animals. The drinking system has a water bowl that contains the water. When the water bowl is empty, it is automatically refilled. The system uses a sensor and a microprocessor. Question A says identify the most appropriate sensor for the system. When we've been given an explanation of a system, they'll usually tell us what is happening with this format. They'll first lay out the condition, in this case, when the water bowl is empty. Then they'll give the corresponding action, in this case, it is automatically refilled. To answer the question of identifying the most appropriate sensor, we would use this portion of the explanation. The question we ask is, how does it determine the results of this condition? In other words, how does it determine when the water bowl is empty? There are a couple different sensors that we can use, but for this example, we'll use a level sensor. You could also say a moisture sensor or a pressure sensor. Question B says, describe how the sensor and the microprocessor are used to automatically refill the water bowl. To answer this question, I've drawn a diagram of how the system might look. We start on the left with the water bowl with the level sensor. The level sensor will detect if the water bowl is empty. It will send an analog signal to the ADC, which will convert it into a digital signal and send it to the microprocessor. The microprocessor will compare the value from the level sensor, and if the microprocessor determines that the bowl is empty, it will send a signal to an actuator which turns the valve on and fills the bowl up for a certain amount of time. Otherwise, if the bowl is not empty, then it will do nothing. This entire system is continuous, meaning it will repeat until it's turned off. To write the answer for six marks, we'll follow a four-step process. Step one, to mention the process that starts with the sensor, goes to the ADC, and to the microprocessor. Step two is to mention the comparison between stored values in the microprocessor. Step three is to describe the actions that occur as a result of the comparison. And step four is to mention that the entire system repeats or is continuous. These four steps form an acronym called SCAR, which is an easy way to remember it in the exam. If you follow this process, you'll always get full marks. Let's begin writing our answer. Step one, the sensor sends analog data to the ADC, which converts it to digital and sends it to the microprocessor. Let's mark that step as complete. The microprocessor compares data to stored values is the second step which we can mark off. Step three, 
if the data indicates the bowl is empty, the microprocessor sends a signal to an actuator to activate the valve for a certain amount of time. Finally, the last step, this process repeats until the system is turned off. Let's mark the answer, just to show where the six marks come from. Firstly, we'd receive a mark for the first sentence. The sensor sends analog data, converting it to digital and sending it to the microprocessor. Then we'd receive a mark for the second sentence that the microprocessor is comparing data to stored values. Then the third sentence, if the data indicates the ball is empty, the microprocessor sends a signal, that is our first mark, to an actuator to activate the valve, that is our second mark for a certain amount of time, that's the third mark for the sentence. The final mark can be awarded to the last sentence, saying that this process repeats. Question 6. A user wants to connect their computer to a network. Identify the component in the computer that is needed to access a network. Almost all motherboards in a computer system come with a component that allows the computer to connect to a network. This component is called the network interface card. The next question says, identify the type of address that is allocated to the component by the manufacturer, which is used to uniquely identify the device. There are two different types of addresses that we know at IG level. The first is the IP address, and the second is the MAC address. A MAC address identifies a device regardless of location, whereas an IP address identifies the geolocation of that device on a network. IP addresses are dependent on location and hence are not assigned by a manufacturer. MAC addresses, on the other hand, are indeed assigned by the manufacturer. Question B says a dynamic internet protocol address is allocated to the computer when it is connected to the network. Identify the device on the network that can connect multiple devices and automatically assign them an IP address. A device which can connect multiple devices and automatically assign them an IP address can only be a router. Whenever you connect to any network, you're almost always connecting to a router. The next question says describe what is meant by a dynamic IP address. This question is for three mocks, meaning that we need to give three unique points about dynamic IP addresses. One trick you can use is to separate it into different parts. The first part about it being an IP address, and the second part about it being a dynamic IP address. An IP address, as we know, is used to uniquely identify a device on a network. So let's write that down. That will give us a point for the IP address portion. Now we need to mention two points about the dynamic portion. There are two different types of IP addresses, dynamic IP addresses and static IP addresses. Whenever the device connects to a network, the router will assign it an IP address. This can either be dynamic or static. A static IP address means that the address will be the same every time the device connects to the network. However, with a dynamic address, it can change every time the device connects to the network. Let's write this point down. This answers the first part of the dynamic IP address. And according to the marking scheme, this will give us three points since we mentioned that it can change and we mentioned that it'll change every time the device connects to a network. So that is this question complete. Question seven. Programmer uses a low level language to write a computer program for a vending machine. Question A says, describe what is meant by a low level language. We have two different types of languages that we know at the IG level, low level and high level. One way to answer this question, if you've forgotten what a low level language is, is to look at what a high level language is and just to take the opposite of that. To start off, we can say that a high level language uses many English words that are understood by humans. The opposite of this would mean that low level languages use abbreviations or a better word, mnemonics. Since a high level language uses many English words, it requires a compiler or an interpreter to be able to be executed by the CPU. These compilers or interpreters are generally very complex programs since high level languages are not close to the language processed by computers. The opposite of this is that low level languages are close to the language processed by computers, which is object code. Examples of a high level language would be Python or Java, whereas an example of low level would be assembly language or machine code. Let's write two of these points to get our two marks. Firstly, a low level language is close to the language processed by computers and the syntax may use mnemonics. Question B says, give two reasons why the programmer would choose to write the computer program in a low-level language instead of a high-level language. 
In our comparison, we mentioned that high-level languages require a compiler or interpreter, so that could be one of the reasons why a programmer would want to choose a low-level language, in that we don't require a compiler or an interpreter. Secondly, since low-level languages are close to computer process languages, they would be quicker to execute since there is not much translation that needs to happen. There are many other reasons you can mention, such as low-level languages can directly manipulate the hardware, they can use specialized hardware, there'll be more memory efficient, the program does not necessarily have to be portable, but for now we can leave it at these two points. Question 8. A manager at a company is concerned about a brute force attack on its employees' user accounts. Question A says, describe how a brute force attack can be used to gain access to the employee user accounts. When someone is performing a brute force attack, generally they are using a trial and error method to try and systematically guess login information or encryption keys. This could consist of entering many passwords or passphrases, hoping that eventually they'll get it correct. Every single password or passphrase is checked until the correct one is found. Let's write three points down and relate it to how a user can gain access to the employee user accounts. First off, we can say that trial and error is used to guess the password of the accounts. All the possible combinations are tried until the correct password is found. This process can either be done manually or automatically using a system. That should give us three marks. Question B says one possible aim for carrying out a brute force attack is to install malware onto the company network. State two other aims for carrying out a brute force attack to gain access to the employee user accounts. To answer this question, we simply need to work out what benefit gaining access to the employee's user accounts would be. The main reason for gaining access to a user account is to be able to log in as that user and view sensitive information. That information could then be deleted or modified, and it could be used to damage the reputation of the business. The next question says, identify three types of malware that could be installed. Malware can be defined as software that is designed to cause disruption to a computer system or to access sensitive information. There are many different types of malware. The first most obvious one would be a virus. A virus works by replicating itself by modifying other programs. Those files would then become corrupted or they could even be deleted. Another type of malware could be a Trojan horse. A Trojan horse works by hiding its true intent by disguising itself as a standard program. And the last type of virus we can mention is spyware. Spyware works by gathering personal information and transmitting it to another entity. That data could then either be sold to a third party or be used for blackmail. But that should give us three marks. Question C says, give two security solutions that could be used to help prevent a brute force attack being successful. To prevent brute force attacks, we need to make sure that the password that the attacker is trying to guess is very difficult to guess. So the first solution could be to use a strong password. Let's look at a few characteristics of strong passwords. Firstly, passwords should be very long. Passwords that are longer than 12 characters are usually quite secure. This is because the longer the password is, the more combinations there are for the attacker to guess. If the attacker is using an automated system to do this, it will exponentially increase the time it takes to guess the password the more characters there are. Secondly, strong passwords should not contain any personal information. The reason for this is that the attacker may know that personal information about you. If your password contains the name of your dog, the attacker may know the name of your dog, and it'll be a starting point for them which will greatly reduce the amount of time it takes for them to guess the password. Lastly, strong passwords should contain a variety of characters. These could be lowercase characters, uppercase characters, symbols, or numbers. The reason for this is the same as the first reason, that there are more combinations in using different types of characters as opposed to just using one type of character. Another solution that can be used to prevent brute force attacks is to use two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication requires two devices to be able to log into the system. First, you would enter your username and password then you'd use a different device to confirm the login attempt. This makes it much harder for someone to get into the system, as it requires them to know your username and password and have access to your second device. But that should give us two marks. Question 9. A company uses robots in its factory to manufacture large pieces of furniture. 
One characteristic of a robot is that it is programmable. State two other characteristics of a robot. Robots can be broken down into three parts. Firstly, that they contain software. Secondly, that that software runs on electrical components. And thirdly, that this is all contained within a mechanical structure. The question mentioned that one characteristic is that the robots are programmable. In other words, that they contain software. Let's write these other two characteristics down. Firstly, robots have electrical components and robots have a mechanical structure. Question B says, give two advantages to company employees of using robots to manufacture large pieces of furniture. This question focuses on the company producing large pieces of furniture. If company employees were to do this, they would need lots of people to be able to pick up the large pieces of furniture. This could be replaced by a single robot. So we can write that employees don't need to handle heavy furniture. When moving heavy furniture around, it might also be dangerous for the company employees. Robots would take that danger away. So for the second reason, we can write that employees would not have to perform dangerous tasks. When robots are used to replace human employees, it is often time to replace repetitive or mundane tasks. This is so that the human employees can utilize their skills in other tasks. We can also write those two reasons, but for now, we'll leave it at these two. Question C says give one disadvantage to the company's owners of using robots to manufacture large pieces of furniture. Manufacturing large pieces of furniture is going to require large machinery. This machinery is going to be very expensive to install and to set up. If the robots malfunction, production may stop, and there would be high maintenance costs. But since this question is only for one mark, we'll leave it at that. Question 10. A student uses the internet for their schoolwork to research what is meant by farming. State the aim of farming. The main purpose of farming is to obtain personal data from a user. So let's write that down. Question B says draw and annotate a diagram to represent the process of farming. Before we draw the diagram, let's go through point by point what happens in the process of farming. First, the user clicks a link and unknowingly downloads malware. When the user tries to go to a specific website, the malware will redirect them to another website. Let's write this step down. We can say that malware is installed to modify the flow of web traffic. Thirdly, when the user tries to visit a specific website, they are redirected to the fake website. Lastly, users may enter personal information into the fake website, such as bank details or login details. Now, let's convert this into a diagram. The first point, the user clicks the link that triggers the download. Once it is downloaded, the malware is installed onto the computer. Then, when the user enters the web address of a real website, the request gets redirected to a fake website. Lastly, the user may enter sensitive information into the fake website. That information would then be sent back to the person who created the malware. And that completes this question. Question C says the student uses a web browser to access data on the internet. Explain the purpose of the web browser. When a browser connects to a website, the server that contains the data sends the web pages over to the web browser. These web pages are normally in the format of HTML, and the browser renders them to display the pages to the user. Let's write that down. We can say that the browser renders HTML files to display the web pages to the user. Question D says storing cookies is one function of the web browser. Give three other functions of the web browser. There are many functions of a web browser. All you would need to do to answer this question is think of what kind of things you would do when you are using a web browser. The first thing you might use is the address bar in order to search for information on the internet using a search engine. Next, you may want to have multiple tabs open if you're working with different websites at once. Finally, if you want to open a website that you previously closed, you can go to the history, which is stored by the browser. There are many other functions, but we'll leave it at those three for now. Question E says, a student visits a website that uses session cookies instead of persistent cookies. Explain the difference between session cookies and persistent cookies. Let's do a comparison table. Firstly, as the name suggests, persistent cookies are not temporary. They are stored on the user's hard drive until they're deleted or they expire. So we can say that they're stored on the hard drive or secondary storage, and they're valid until they're deleted or they expire. We can say the opposite for session cookies, which are only valid when the browser is open. 
This means that instead of being stored on the hard drive, they're stored in primary memory, usually the RAM. That gives us four comparison points, so let's write the answer. For the first point, we can say that session cookies are stored in RAM, whereas persistent cookies are stored on the hard drive. Then, for the second point, we can say that session cookies are deleted when the browser is closed, whereas persistent cookies are not lost until they are deleted or they expire. That concludes the walkthrough for this paper. If you'd like more videos like this, check out the channel or check out my course in the description. Otherwise, happy studying, and I'll see you next time.